my lovely imps, tonight, to cap off tonight's stream, we are going to react to a video by a channel that I truly love, Chariot, spelled very interestingly like this, with the, with a four and a ten, okay? Whoa, 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 hey, the video's starting. I don't want to start it. Chariot. I'm going to link the video here, and of course it'll be linked in the actual final upload. Boop. Boop. Um, so there's the link for the video. And we are going to be reacting to this video by Chariot. Chariot has been undertaking a series of incredibly in-depth, incredibly thoughtful, incredibly high quality video game retrospectives with a critical eye towards the poetics of gaming and, um, and towards politics, which is just a perfect match with the general culture of my channel. And tonight, I have been recommended to watch Chariot's video on Halo Reach. Now, I played Halo Reach. I never beat the single player campaign, but I played a lot of the multiplayer. So I'm super interested to learn about the political themes that were present in the story. And I think a lot of you will be too. So without any further ado, let's watch Chariot's video the Winter of Mankind, a Halo Reach retrospective. Let's go. Granger looked into the fire. Phoenix. What? There was a silly damn bird called a phoenix back before Christ. Every few hundred years he built a pyre and burnt himself up. He must have been first cousin to man. But every time he burnt himself up, he sprang out of the ashes. He got himself born all over again. And it looks like we're doing the same thing over and over. But we've got one damn thing the phoenix never had. We know the damn silly thing we just did. We know all the damn silly things we've done for a thousand years, and as long as we know that, and always have it around, where we can see it, someday we'll stop making the goddamn funeral pyres and jumping in the middle of them. We pick up a few more people that remember every generation. He took the pan off the fire and let the bacon cool, and they ate it, slowly, thoughtfully. Now, let's get on upstream, said Granger, and hold on to one thought. You're not important. You're not anything. Someday, the load we're carrying with us may help someone. But even when we had the books on hand a long time ago, we didn't use what we got out of them. We went right on insulting the dead. We went right on spitting in the graves of all the poor ones who died before us. We're going to meet a lot of lonely people in the next week, and the next month, and the next year. And when they ask us what we're doing, you can say, we're remembering. That's where we'll win out in the long run. And someday, we'll remember so much that we'll build the biggest goddamn steam shovel in history, and dig the biggest grave of all time, and shove war in, and cover it up. Come on now. We're going to go build a mirror factory first, and put out nothing but mirrors for the next year, and take a long look in them. Hell of an opening. Absolute hell of an opening. I've made no secret, as I've written about video games, that I was a latecomer to the genre. I often talk about how we didn't have video games until I was in high school, and even then we got our first Xbox when I was 17, so my most formative gaming experiences were at friends' houses, where I didn't have the gaming literacy to understand what was going on, or what I was supposed to do. Very early on I became aware of a game series called Halo, however, due to its sheer popularity. My friends played it, my cousins played it, kids at school who I barely talked to and who probably didn't even like me played it, and I couldn't avoid its public profile, especially by the time Halo 3 came around. The later sensation of Halo Reach was, even to a neophyte like myself, therefore, entirely unsurprising. Reach was, by all accounts, a great leap forward for the Halo series that would be followed by a series of, at first small hops and then later massive lunges backwards. 
I suppose it is, at the end of the day, somewhat ironic to reminisce about the good old days of Halo, given where- Yeah, Halo Reach was on something else. Um, so, I played the first three Halos storyline. Like, I, I really liked Halo 1, 2, and 3, story-wise. Um, and Reach, I never sat down and played the story. But I loved the multiplayer in Reach. And the multiplayer in Reach was truly awesome. It was... I know a lot of people have really strong memories of all of the all of the early Halo games, the first three Halo games multiplayer, and for good reason. Um, all, you know, the, the classic Halo multiplayer, you know, split screen with your friends was a vibe. The, you know, the early uh, uh, Xbox Live on, you know, Halo 2 and Halo 3, but... Halo Reach had something else going on. There was a magic in that multiplayer. It was incredible. It was something incredible. Thank you so much, Dragonborn94. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for supporting the show. Let's continue. Where this video is going when we get to later citations and the timing of this upload in the context of certain popular discourses about things like fascism and popular culture. Ooh. I first feel obligated to explain why this game was great. Not every classic Bungie Halo game was better than every new game. I liked the story of the originals, but Combat Evolved was light in story compared to the others. For sure, I liked the sure. gameplay of the originals, but especially at higher difficulties, Halo 2 had unbalanced gameplay. I think people selectively remember the original trilogy, and maybe one day, we'll talk about those games. But Reach was... different. Halo Reach contained massive developments in enemy AI behavior, new innovations in gunplay, new creative variety in loadouts and powers, and the, as of then, greatest degree of innovation and customization. Reach allowed you to not only play either a female or male character in PvP, with your own armor stylized to express yourself, it also allowed you to carry that exact character over into PvE, into the campaign story. Your version of the campaign's central character will look different from that of other players, a fact borne out by the captured version I have uploaded for this video. This is worth remembering for the course of any following discussion, especially the story, or any instances where I refer to Noble Six as her or she, which is accurate to this particular playthrough, but not necessarily others. Reach has 11 missions with the first being a relatively straightforward introduction to the team, their command structure, and their way of doing things. Noble Actual ends on the introduction of Noble Team, with the player being Noble Six, and Nobles 1 through 5 being Carter, Kat, June, Emil, and George. Heading into the second mission, Winter Contingency, they assist the player in investigating some activity in the rural areas of the colonized planet Reach. This mission goes awry when the Covenant, a religious coalition of alien species hellbent on exterminating humanity and obtaining ancient alien technology on the basis of its religious significance to them, strike at the civilians and also Noble Team. The team fights back and rescues a civilian as well as scientific data, and contacts their superior officer to warn them of the coming alien invasion. From there, the game escalates gradually over the course of the early missions. Oni, Sword Base, begins the large-scale initiative by the United Nations Space Command against the Covenant Advance Forces, including Noble Team entering into a military installation run by the Office of Naval Intelligence to meet Dr. Catherine Halsey. This mission, along with the previous two, front-load a lot of natural characterization for the team. Carter is a by-the-book leader, and Kat is his competitively witty maverick second-in-command, a fact borne out directly in the interaction with Halsey, which also reinforces an element of George's characterization as the lone Spartan II on the team, the distinction being that he has greater bodily augmentations due to Halsey herself raising him to be a Spartan from the time he was a child. George and Emil also get some quick characterization in the earlier mission when George tries to calm the civilian they rescued, and Emil takes pot shots at his clumsy social skills. Even the opening cinematic introduces the team with a sort of quick acknowledgement of who they are, Jun is quiet and methodical, shown by how he takes notice of Noble Six, but doesn't stop counting his bullets. Emil is creative and violent, expressed in his helmet carving and preoccupation with knives. Carter is the consummate leader, speaking directly and taking orders as easily as he gives them. Kat isn't what you expect, the first female Spartan we've ever actually seen in-game, who lurches into frame with her cybernetic prosthetic arm. George barely gets any introduction until Noble Team's actual mission is underway, although even at first blush you'd know him. 
he's the big one. Noble Team delivers the data they recovered to Halsey, but Noble Six and Jun get a stealth mission where they fight through the Covenant to get eyes on just exactly what forces have been deployed to reach. This night operation harkens back to the original Halo Combat Evolved, where infiltration of a Covenant vessel required sniper combat in the dead of night. The guns handle much more precisely in this game, but the sniper rifle still feels impactful. Yeah, the, the, the gunplay in Halo Reach was very memorable. I remember it very well. Um, it's, uh, you know, I don't know. I've always enjoyed, I always enjoyed Halo. I had a lot of fun with, like I said, all the, the first three games I really enjoyed a lot. But um, Reach had something else going on. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a sucker for good gunplay. Especially gunplay that really has some weight to it. And um, it definitely introduced that. You know, the early Halo games were a little floaty, a little bit arcadey. A lot of shooters were at the time. Um, not all of them. The, the, the uh, Gears of War games were super weighty, and, and all their guns had a lot, of, a lot of chunk to them. But it was also a different style of shooter. It was a third-person shooter and, and whatnot. But, yeah. Yeah, th me too, Windleby. Windleby says, I only did multiplayer on Reach. That was basically what I did, yep. It was so good. Gears of War was, so, I, I really, the thing is, I did not care about the story of Gears of War at all. And I don't think I do, um, even still, really, that much. But I really, really enjoyed multiplayer, especially the Horde mode in uh, Gears of War. Just because the weapons felt so good. And there were not many games that did weapons like Gears of War did at that time. Gears of War had so much weight and punchiness to it. It had so much of a, a solid feel to the gameplay that was so memorable. And Reach was the first of the Halo games that like that felt like they were trying to add more heft to these big, gigantic weapons being wielded by robots. Anyway, let's continue. This level ends with the discovery that the Covenant is launching a full-scale invasion of Reach which leads into the next mission on the tip of the spear. This level is distinctly memorable to me, not so much for its story significance as for the large amount of time spent fighting in the open field and destroying Covenant pop-up installations, although this is for the end of clearing the way for a large UNSC ship to bombard the Covenant forces directly. However, this ends in catastrophe when a concealed Covenant vessel of massive size reveals itself in orbit and strikes back at the UNSC, the team's goals quickly shift to finding a clever way to take out the massive threat. Kat's idea comes to fruition in the next mission, Long Night of Solace, with the team electing to send the player and George on a small craft to fight in orbit against the Covenant, and with a UNSC ship that agrees to transfer its science fiction slipspace drive to a vessel that can board the massive Covenant ship so that it can be triggered remotely to destroy the vessel from within by tearing it apart. This goes to plan until George informs Noble Six that the remote trigger for the slipspace drive was damaged in the fighting and he's choosing to stay behind to detonate it manually. George throws the player out of the window as Noble Six witnesses the drive trigger, consuming George and the Covenant. The level ends with a revelation that this ship was one of many, as the Covenant fleet emerges from the dark of space to reinforce their advance force. The subsequent level, Exodus, largely follows Noble Six as she fights across the planet's surface to regroup with her team and intervene as the Covenant's attempt to wipe the human population from the planet reaches a desperate height. The next level, New Alexandria, showcases the scale of the destruction from the invasion as it escalates. The entire titular city is burning, and the planet has begun to follow. Noble Team splits up again to aid in the defense and regroups to be called by command for a supposed demolition operation at the same base they met Halsey. During the Covenant's attack on the city, the team's armor shields are EMP'd, and when they emerge from cover across the open area, a sniper kills Cat mid-sentence. Her dialogue, if the player pays attention, actually implies she's figured out that the mission the team is about to go on is a ruse, and sure enough, following her death, the team arrives at Sword Base for the mission The Package, and is informed by Dr. Halsey that what she actually needs them for is a defense of the technology Oni has developed that could help them win the war. To that effect, in the mission The Pillar of Autumn, the team fights their way to deliver the package, which is actually Cortana from the main series, to Captain Keys of the first game. Juno splits off to escort Dr. Halsey, Carter sacrifices himself in a suicide attack to clear a path for the team, Emil perishes in hand-to-hand -hand combat defending the anti-aircraft gun needed to clear the Pillar of Autumn for takeoff, 
and Noble Six stays behind to fire the AA gun until she's left to make her heroic last stand in the final mission, Lone Wolf. Halsey's narration plays over somber music as it's revealed that Noble Team's mission was a success despite everything, that their efforts ultimately turned the tide of battle, and that they are ultimately gone, but not forgotten, their spirits living on. The deaths of Noble Team, in many ways the core of the story, are as good a place to begin discussing this game as any. It has often been observed by fans that their deaths are poetic. Carter, the team's leader, goes down with his ship. Cat, the brains behind the operation, dies by being shot in the brain. June, the silent sniper, vanishes from the narrative. George, the biggest, toughest bruiser of the lot, dies first. Emil, the knife-wielding sociopath, is stabbed to death. Noble Six, the lone wolf, perishes in solitude. These are all salient and even moving observations. However, there's even more to this element of the game's writing that often goes unsaid. For example, consider the opening cinematic. June is the first of the team to spot Noble Six in the opening cinematic, and he's the only one who lives to tell the tale. Carter is the last to get onto the aircraft in the beginning, and he ends up dying on one. He tells Noble Six we're a team, that lone wolf stuff stays behind. Ironically, Noble Six is literally the lone wolf who stays behind. George dies thinking he saved the planet, his home, and leaves Noble Six to wander through Reach as humanity wow. is genocided in the following mission called Exodus, a reference to a book in the Bible where the Israelites travel to the land that was promised to them, leading to the genocide of the Canaanites. Cat is one step ahead of a narrative twist in the story when she's killed out of nowhere. Emil not only wields a knife while getting stabbed, he also literally sharpens his knife on his armor and carves a skull into his helmet with his knife, literally the first to apply a blade to his own body. And his final words are, I'm ready, how about you? Noble Six is a faceless protagonist but for her helmet visor, and the first and last cutscenes of the game show that same visor, effectively making Noble Six the face of Reach, both the planet and the game. As I see it, the deaths of Noble Team can be separated into nearly three categories, each with two aspects represented by one character each, the Martyr Soldier, the Tragic Soldier, and the Ignominious Soldier. Carter and George are the Martyr Soldiers, with Carter choosing death knowing the near impossible odds and almost assured futility of their struggle in a defeat that is close at hand, and George choosing death with the presumption of victory and a sacrifice that would count for a great deal against a powerful enemy. The distinction between these is the scale of what either character expects from their sacrifice. Cat and Emil are the tragic soldiers, with Cat being taken unawares after expressing that she isn't yet sure if their struggle is futile, and Emil also being attacked unexpectedly, but in the context of understanding that he was likely going to die that day. The distinction between these is not whether the specific circumstance of death is sudden and unexpected, but whether death in general is ultimately expected. These two categories represent different styles of narrative heroic sacrifice, essentially distinguished not so much between willing and unwilling, but rather between knowing and unknowing, mm. and in various degrees. This is of great importance to analyzing the narrative because each style of heroic sacrifice lends itself to a different emotional appeal in its own story beat. The third category is the most provocative to me personally. Juna and Noble Six are the ignominious soldiers, with Jun leaving off into the horizon of an uncertain future, and Noble Six dying for certain, but remaining entirely faceless and nameless in the process. The two are distinguished by whether they are knowable in their identity or knowable in their fate. This category of heroic sacrifice creates a narrative impression of the uncertainty of the soldier or hero, either before or after their sacrifice. For soldiers who have yet to fight their upcoming battle or war, we do not yet know their fate. For soldiers who die on the battlefield either in solitude or in numbers so immense that their individuality is removed beyond count, we cannot know their identities. You may also notice- Ah, I think this is- I find- that's- this is a- this is a really good observation. I- I don't- I- again, I- I, I feel like I've- I've missed out not having played this game. There's a lot going on here. That's some, that's some, that's some, that's some talented uh, uh, characterization of the Spartans from Halo. Is that the six team members are divided into three groups of even pairs, mirrored in an alternate- I mean, I've always known that Reach was a fairly lore heavy game, 
But this isn't just lore. This is like uh this is an this is an incredible attention to to detail in writing characters that uh I I am I am I love hearing about. That's incredible. Pattern of 1 and 4, 2 and 5, and 3 and 6 respectively. This creates a kind of sacred mathematical formula of narrative heroic sacrifice, a trinity of dual reflections. This concept of the ignominious soldier is also reminiscent of the American Arlington Monument, Tomb yep. of the Unknown Soldier. I was so thinking of that, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Yep. Soldier, which serves at once to commemorate a real soldier whose identity was unknown, but who perished in World War I in France, but also as a larger allusion to American soldiers who perished abroad in their country's wars, and whose identities remain lost, or as the tomb describes its soldier, known but to God. In the current era, this tomb is arguably most frequently invoked, at least in my experience, in discussions of the Vietnam War, which of course came much later. The tomb is a symbol, more than only the resting place of one man. It represents the idea of the nameless, faceless soldier. Fittingly, the Greek figures inscribed upon it originally supposedly stood for peace, victory, and American manhood, with the last being reinterpreted later as the more gender-neutral valor. I say this is fitting for our purposes, because as a cultural icon, it lends itself perfectly to Noble Six's characterization, right down to the gender ambiguity. This parallel does make any comparisons from Halo to US military culture a bit obvious, but there are other parallels. The language and practices of Oni and UNSC operatives brings with it the baggage of military science fiction tropes that have a long tradition of mirroring US military culture. This positions Halo Reach as an entry in a larger continuity of military fiction common not only to science fiction as a genre, but also to American media. It has often been remarked that video games as a medium are still in their infancy, or otherwise that they borrow over much from film as a genre, due to the structure of games with cutscenes essentially inserting short films or slideshows in between sections of gameplay, leaning heavily on the structure of film. In my view, this is neither an unfortunate necessity of gaming, nor is it really a drawback of those games that utilize it. I think an unthinking reliance on cutscenes is theoretically a weakness of a game's writing, but the reality of many games is that they use cutscenes to create what is functionally a hybrid medium. Mm -hmm. You can watch the Halo Reach cutscenes back to back in a YouTube upload, and if you don't know anything about this game and aren't interested in playing but think the story sounds interesting, I actually think you should. But the important thing to note is that if you do, you're effectively watching a science fiction film, and in particular, you'll note you're watching a science fiction war film. So I think it's beyond doubt that what we're dealing in here is in some ways a work of art that operates in the cultural context of military narrative. But what concerns me primarily in the case of Reach is its deployment of heroism. All six members of Noble Team are, in my opinion, fantastic exemplars of the hero-soldier trope. They don't just present the idea in cases of strong writing. The pathos of the character writing, coupled chiefly with somber vistas and beautiful, tragic soundscapes, provides a deep experience for many players regardless of their larger view of the themes in the work. There's been a great deal of discussion of late in online spaces on the nature of fascism, for example, and its relevance to different science fiction works presenting tropes and notions common to military science fiction. Halo has not been the chief subject of that discussion on any front that I've personally seen, but it has lingered, festered even, in the public consciousness. This essay is not an exploration of fascism in gaming. It is, however, a precursor to that exact essay in a more applicable case study, looking generally at militarism broadly. Notions of militarism, in addition to tangentially relevant ideas around nationalism, xenophobia, etc., are important to understanding fascism in media, but it is not simply the case that all these parts, or even one individual part, is equivalent to the broader whole, and an exploration of that concept would require a deeper insight into how the media itself functions, not merely how it can be interpreted. One day soon we will return to that discussion, but what's important for our purposes here is how blurry many of these distinctions are. There's also a requisite political education for that discussion, and frankly, I think it's a lot easier for our purposes here to dwell primarily on militarism and heroism, not to the exclusion of associated ideas, but with a preference for those particulars. With all of that said, I found I could not finish out this notion of heroic sacrifice and the soldier without touching on the essay which is the keystone for seeing fascism in art, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many with whom I have spoken. 
many discourses on whether this or that work of art is fascist tend to reduce themselves to pondering whether a work explicitly advocates or endorses fascism as we understand it. They are bogged down, not only in case studies, but in a kind of debate that can only yield the style of analysis and discussion that presents a work as qualitatively fascistic on any level on the basis of an essentially exegetic reading, as if for text to contain a meaning, to enact meaning, requires for them to simply be activist works with a call to action. They tend to neglect the almost inarguably more intriguing and compelling theoretical basis for this conversation, as put by Walter Benjamin in his essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. We will be returning to this in the future, but for now I feel compelled to quote his epilogue. Quote, the growing proletarianization of modern man and the increasing formation of masses are two aspects of the same process. Fascism attempts to organize the newly created proletarian masses without affecting the property structure which the masses strive to eliminate. Fascism sees this right here, fascism attempts to organize the newly created proletarian masses without affecting the property structure with the which the masses strive to eliminate. That is the, right there, that phenomenon is the empty right-wing uh, right populism that we see all the time these days. In fact, you, you've probably not only heard me refer to it, but you've probably refer heard to basically every lefty content creator you could watch has at some point referred to the sort of anti-elite, uh, vague right-wing populism that is very that is sort of increasingly popular in the Trump era. Um, that is exactly that is exactly what's being talked about here. It is a uh, it is an attempt to to take the sort of dispossessed working people. Uh, and 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 get them angry at specific structures without ever actually addressing um, the, the the structure of property in and of itself. Oh, it's the it's this banker or it's that banker or it's those bankers. You'll notice they tend to fixate on that. It's it's very specifically directing the attention towards an individual group or an individual company or whatever, and away from criticizing the broader structure. Anyway, I don't want to interrupt uh, Walter Benjamin and Chariot while they're cooking, but I thought it would be worthy to bring people's attention that, that, to, to, to translate that a little bit to what uh, is a concept you are all undeniably um, familiar with. Chariot says, yes, it's also the function of anti-Semitism or one of them. A abso fucking -lutely. Absolutely. Yes. Um, that is like anti-Semitism is in service of this type of goal. Um, I mean, they do it now. There's, there's, yeah, the scapegoating of groups is, is absolutely, th that, yeah, exactly. Is it salvation in giving these masses not their rights, but instead a chance to express themselves? The masses have a right to change property relations. Fascism seeks to give them an expression while preserving property. The logical result of fascism is the introduction of aesthetics into political life. The violation of the masses, whom fascism with its Fuhrer cult forces to their knees, has its counterpart in the violation of an apparatus which is pressed into the production of ritual values. All efforts to render politics aesthetic culminate in one thing, war. War and war only can set a goal for mass movements on the largest scale while respecting the traditional property system. This is the political formula for the situation. The technological formula may be stated as follows. Only war makes it possible to mobilize all of today's technical resources while maintaining the property system. It goes without saying that the fascist apotheosis of war does not employ such arguments. Still, Marinetti says in his manifesto on the Ethiopian colonial war, quote, For 27 years we futurists have rebelled against the branding of war as anti-aesthetic. Accordingly we state, War is beautiful because it establishes man's dominion over the subjugated machinery by means of gas masks, terrifying megaphones, flamethrowers, and small tanks. War is beautiful because it initiates the dreamt of metalization of the human body. War is beautiful because it enriches a flowering meadow with the fiery orchids of machine guns. War is beautiful because it combines the gunfire, the cannonades, the ceasefire, the scents, and the stench of putrefaction into a symphony. War is beautiful because it creates new architecture, like that of the big tanks, the geometrical formation flights, the smoke spirals from burning villages, and many others. 
poets and artists of futurism, remember these principles of an aesthetics of war so that your struggle for a new literature and a graphic art may be illumined by them." End quote. This manifesto has the virtue of clarity. Its formations deserve to be accepted by dialecticians. To the latter, the aesthetics of today's war appears as follows. If the natural utilization of productive forces is impeded by the property system, the increase in technical devices, in speed, and in the sources of energy will press for an unnatural utilization, and this is found in war. The destructiveness of war furnishes proof that society has not been mature enough to incorporate technology as its organ, that technology has not been sufficiently developed to cope with the elemental forces of society. The horrible features of imperialistic warfare are attributable to the discrepancy between the tremendous means of production and their inadequate utilization in the process of production. In other words, to unemployment and the lack of markets. Imperialistic war is a rebellion of technology which collects in the form of human material the claims to which society has denied its natural material. Instead of draining rivers, society directs a human stream into a bed of trenches. Instead of dropping seeds from airplanes, it drops incendiary bombs over cities. And through gas warfare, the aura is abolished in a new way. Fiat ars, periat mundus, says fascism, and as Marinetti admits, expects war to supply the artistic gratification of a sense perception that has been changed by technology. This is evidently the consummation of l'art pour l'art. Mankind, which in Homer's time was an object of contemplation for the Olympian gods, now is one for itself. Its self-alienation has reached such a degree that it can experience its own destruction as an aesthetic pleasure of the First Order. This is the situation of politics which fascism is rendering aesthetic. Communism responds by politicizing art." End quote. A little background before we proceed. First, Marinetti, for those unaware, refers to Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, co-author of The Manifesto of the Italian Fascists of Combat, also often shortened to the Fascist Manifesto. Of course, hindsight may betray the avowed views of the historical Italian fascists with the truth of their ultimate actions soon to follow. Benjamin's analysis draws on a real understanding of historical fascist movements and their ideology, and it is for this reason that he calls their approach to politics aesthetic. The fascist, for Benjamin, takes the fundamental implication in our society that the people within it should be allowed to organize its property, and redirects that potential action in defense of the existing property rights of the status quo, by giving them an outlet for that energy, not towards economic justice, but towards aesthetic expression. One may perhaps hear in this the ring of the words of Andrew Breitbart, whose namesake publication would later become a flagship of the American alt-right, as it was buoyed by the MAGA movement, that politics is downstream of culture. This is, in its analytic posture, diametrically opposed to the Marxist materialist conception of history, but as self-justification, it is a self-evident rationale. One can see in the Spartan super-soldiers a frightening and entrancing case of the metalization of the human body, of Marinetti's worldview. Spartans have augmentations within and augmentations without. In Dr. Halsey, we see a strange reflection of the fascist scientists of the 20th century. Her Spartans are made to serve initially the convenience and the power of the UNSC, but in the process raise humanity itself to a higher calling, a higher existence. Benjamin describes the notion of self-destruction as aesthetic pleasure, and is this not present more generally also in film narratives of heroic martyrdom through combat, of brave soldiers yeah. charging forward in self-sacrificial glory? overwhelmed by impossible odds, cut down before their time serving the purpose of a solemn duty? Much of what Benjamin describes we see also in Halo Reach. Is Halo fascist? Questions such as this are bound for the purgatory of discursive reduction. Until we, as critics of the arts, learn to break from the norms of seeing meaning itself as exegetic, a message prescribed either by a particular author or by the text itself for our consideration, until we break from the confines of ascribing intent either to the author or to that abstract text itself, a move one must observe fit only for the worship of an omnipotent god, we will never be free of this curse, and we will never have true understanding. Halo Reach contains elements and ideas of fascism. It plays with them in its expression of them. It engages them through the gamer's play. The game itself has discursive power. Too often we see that power as following from a kind of apparent meaning, a message sent and received. So we neglect the larger question, 
the act of play itself puts to us. How does reach make us feel? How does it make us think? If we are wise, we may think to ask of ourselves, am I loving or am I hating? I am such a fool that I thought I could tell. From this discussion of the potential for seeing ourselves in Halo Reach, we may well ask what we are bound to take away from this game. I would like to pose two ways of seeing, both provocative and both valid, and then offer them up for you to synthesize. The first of these is, I think, the more cynical of the two. In The Hollywood War Machine, U.S. Militarism and Popular Culture, by Carl Boggs and Tom Pollard, the authors articulate that, quote, One of the remarkable features of American public life today is the extent to which Hollywood studios continue to turn warfare into stunning media spectacles, a phenomenon shared with TV and video games like movies, beneficiaries of the same high-tech assets, and go on to say that, quote, If graphic scenarios of death and destruction wind up as the predictable offshoot of Empire, they are also the stock and trade of blockbusters, both mirroring and contributing to the culture of militarism that permeates early 21st century America. So it has, in some degree or another, continued to be, even up through the continuation of Hollywood franchises, such as those discussed by Boggs and Pollard like Transformers. Boggs and Pollard discuss the direct effect that the United States... Let's continue. Don't worry, I don't think you'll, you'll stay lost. Don't worry. ...media has had in endorsing moves from administrations like that of George W. Bush to Barack Obama in their execution of policies like mounting civilian drone strike deaths in the Middle East to violence committed by the Israeli government in Gaza, at least indirect, but highly tangible results. They say, quote, President Obama, following President Bush, has proclaimed that U.S. warfare against its enemies has served to make the nation stronger, protecting its seemingly fragile security. The problem is that this official rationale, along with the pretenses of promoting democracy and human rights, clashes starkly with the historical reality. Such claims are met with derision around the world, yet sadly are taken seriously by most Americans, including the educated elite. One reason for this yawning gulf is the pervasive influence of media culture, which does so much to legitimate the warfare state and its reputed foreign ventures." End quote. Al the Healer says, this is fantastic. Arlo says, this is really good. Yeah. There's a reason I like, there's a reason I, I, I promote Chariot's videos as often as possible. Chariot is so talented at this type of media analysis. And I am just brimming with excitement for every new video, but also for the future of Chariot's work. Chariot's always cooking. Boggs and Pollard see media, television, film, video games, and what have you, as part of what they term the always crucial mechanisms of legitimation of empire. This claim may be received in the context of video games by some as overly Thompson-esque. After all, neither conservatives nor liberals ever fully substantiated their theses about either violence in video games causing violence or, in the other case, sexism in video games causing sexism. If this is the case, critics of perceived woke values in gaming surely have nothing to worry about at the day's end. I would posit instead that it is the case that media can present an audience with certain implicit values, certain ways of seeing, to borrow a phrase from John Berger, that instill in some audience members certain perspectives. If video games cannot be propaganda, then surely the Japanese and American studios wasted a considerable amount of time and money creating Momotaro no Umiwashi, or Der Fuhrer's Face starring Donald Duck in animated form. I would instead take a position more attentive to the qualities of film and video games in either case. Seeing is not always a direct path to believing, and play is not always an invitation to reality. Not every child who plays a game with pretend guns grows up to be a killer. In fact, in America, presumably most do not. Where earlier our concern was to establish what the heroic sacrifice of the soldier inspires in the audience emotionally, and how to understand it, now we're at a crossroads. Our first path, the path more traveled by left-wing critics at least, is at least worthy of momentary consideration. If the game does affirm empire by presenting us a certain way of seeing empires and their militarism, setting aside any questions of which games we like, many players may feel they are subject to a kind of servility while playing. They may recoil from the experience, feeling that some variety of political message has been presented to them through art, 
not only narrative, but the swelling score, the powerful visuals, and so on. And it is one that, even if it does not implicate them morally, inspires moral revulsion. This, while fictional, is not so different from an emotional response in seeing atrocities in other media, even when that media is the nightly news. Boggs and Pollard declare that, quote, with moral numbing comes something akin to zombie politics, a national psychosis of alienation and retreat that undercuts political debate, end quote. There are certainly loose parallels in Halo Reach to those media affairs which may fatigue Americans. The Office of Naval Intelligence, or ONI, may evoke in its clandestine operations shades of the Central Intelligence Agency, or CIA. The United Nations Space Command, or UNSC, may strike players in terms of the accents and jargon of its soldiers as reminiscent of U.S. forces backing the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO. Still, it's not all one-to-one. -one. There are other cultural influences in Halo, and humanity itself is positioned as the protagonist of Halo Reach, not any nation. This often remarked upon feature of military science fiction inspires in turn questions of humanization, where the human race is pitted against other species in the same way historical oppression of human beings often involved those oppressed humans being cast as themselves inhuman, lesser races or even lesser species via the false distinctions of scientific racism. The parallel cannot be avoided, and yet, even following that parallel, Halo remains provocative. Reach might be one-sided, but fans of the original trilogy, of Halo ODST, or even those who have played Halo 5 Guardians or Halo Infinite, may see the posture that the series has towards its non-human alien species at times soulful, thought-provoking, and profound. One might be tempted to take a single read on the trope of alien warfare and interstellar human empire in Halo, were it so easy. A more cutting read might lean into questions around the portrayal of human militarism and its relationship with religious symbolism in Forerunner technology. Boggs and Pollard write that, quote, American politics has always been informed by a messianic belief in national destiny, merged with notions of historical progress, a sense that people could have mastery over the course of events, a certitude about national supremacy and its entitlement. That's so... It, we were just... It's, it's really funny. We were just talking about a, an aspect of exactly that in the when we were just talking about the voting discourse, right? That, that, um, that like, people are... Sort of buy in to the 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 sort of message in American democracy that like your individual vote is is a part of the of the advancement of historical progress um, that you're participating in in the betterment of the world with every single vote and and things like that. It's so deeply ingrained um, in in the national myth of of American democracy. Um, regardless of its connection to reality, um, you know, regardless of, of what type of election you're talking about, the act itself uh, is, is, is sometimes sort of framed as a proof of your mastery over the course of events. It's a unique civilizing mission. Here we have an ideology, simultaneously elite and mass, embracing American exceptionalism, religious fervor, and national supremacy mixed inevitably with the idea of attaining virtue through military action." End quote. The context for these claims also offers up a read of patriotism as secular religion and a case study for some of the aforementioned qualities in The White Man's Burden, a phrase borrowed from a poem by Rudyard Kipling. Natural RKI says, Never forget the right wants you dead. You can vote or you can die. Choose. I feel like you might be missing something. I think you might not have been paying attention. Literally doing the South Park meme. Vote or die, motherfucker, vote or die! Vote or die, motherfucker, vote or die! Early science fiction. Uh, you know it's not a good thing when you, uh, when you go out of your way to become a joke from South Park. Space Empire retains certain elements of its inspiration. I think many of the claims of critics like Boggs and Pollard as they are directed towards the film industry... Are... Hey, wouldn't it be funny if you voted and died? Wouldn't that be funny? Any other industry could apply to video games. 
Certainly this idea of imperialist messianic destiny maps onto the human inheritance of the mantle previously occupied by the forerunners. But where Boggs and Pollard note that American politicians understanding the connection between imperialist intervention abroad and reprisal at home appears rare, or that, quote, a reversal of military agendas seems unlikely. Oh, Elac, this is a treat for you. Here, I'm going to give you the link. Elac, you're going to love this. This is Chariot's excellent, excellent Halo Reach video. It has been incredible so far. Let's continue. I'll engage you after this, RKI. I don't want to interrupt this enjoyable video. I had to I jump back a little bit because I missed like some Box and Pollard, as they are directed towards the film industry or any other Let's continue. industry, could apply to video games. Certainly, this idea of imperialist messianic destiny maps onto the human inheritance of the mantle previously occupied by the forerunners. But where Boggs and Pollard note that American politicians understanding the connection between imperialist intervention abroad and reprisal at home appears rare, or that, quote, a reversal of military agendas seems unlikely, unquote, it seems to me that art provides a broad opportunity. Perhaps it is precisely because the game is interactive, but I think that when we play video games like Halo Reach, we're approaching something more profound than just another American sniper. This essay is not a descriptive recount of Halo Reach to prove to you that you should play it, which you should, or a brief surface-level reading of Halo Reach casting it in one particular light to show a dominant reading. The nature of some of the themes of Halo Reach make that possible, but the more I worked on this video, the less interested I became in writing about how I think of Reach a certain way. I do, of course, have my own reading, and I won't be shying away from that. I don't think I have. My greater interest has been in pursuing what these views imply, both about Reach and about playing video games. Reach, like so many games I've chosen to talk about in these essays, is so provocative in such a specific way to me that it has, as a work of art, risen above my concern for a specific reading and into a larger question about the potential of a game, in this case a military... Thank you, Mark. I deeply appreciate that. Thank you so much. ...first-person shooter to tell a certain kind of story. This kind of story. Of colored armor and super soldier fraternity. And of the legacy of humanity itself. Because, as earlier noted, to play with an idea is not necessarily to endorse it. Discussions of play engender distinct discussions of meaning. Inferring meaning from a video game as a text requires a more robust approach specifically because the game is interactive. It is not the other way around, as those who condemn gaming often misunderstand. In this, I see an opportunity for us to engage critically and learn in the process. In Film as Public Pedagogy in the U.S. Culture of Militarism, the doctoral thesis of Douglas S. Morris, the author writes that, quote, These films and countless others reveal how few political and moral constraints there are in the dominant culture, as opposed to popular culture responses, on the applications of U.S. violence and thus suggest that elite U.S. society at large is failing morally and politically in terms of providing an understanding of the human and environmental costs, risks, and consequences of promoting so much militarism and unrestrained violence. These films and numerous others across the history of U.S. militarized film productions also reveal that as a culture we spend a lot of time studying and celebrating militarism, but very little time studying alternatives that might celebrate a socially just peace. Many U.S. war films in various genres, including The Bridges at Toko Ri, Taxi Driver, Rambo, Full Metal Jacket, Dirty Harry, Tears of the Sun, Rules of Engagement, Mystic River, Man on Fire, etc., also show heroes who are lone figures, lost souls, largely lacking in community support, struggling to find an alternative identity outside their violent selves, lacking in love, decency, and companionship, lacking in moral guidance, and seemingly blind to the physical, emotional, and psychological consequences of their destructive actions in the lives of others. Again, against the grain of each film, there's an undertone of a morality tale. The films thus suggest a culture lacking in enriching and enlivening cooperative public spaces, including the formal education arena, in which citizens can find opportunities to develop our multiple individualities Chris, it's wonderful to see you. Thank you for the good vibes. We are uh, enjoying a fantastic video essay by Chariot. 
uh, about Halo Reach. It has been very, very thoughtful uh, and incredibly interesting. It's wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for coming by. I hope you're doing great. Let's continue. Within networks of political and moral solidarity, friendship, creative support, and build a sense of agency and empowerment not rooted in domination, destruction, and violence. So, one revelation provided by militarized films is that we have created tragic conditions that generate the films in the first place, conditions that must be challenged in order to overcome the tragedy. In that recognition are the seeds of a pedagogy of hope. What a critical film pedagogy reveals, then, is that... Oh, this concept uh, right here. Um, where did it go here? One revelation provided by militarized films is that we have created tragic conditions that generate the films in the first place. Um, this makes me think of how the um, there was a there was a text that I read by a group by a group called the Invisible Committee, and they talked about social media in a similar regard. That um, that you know, uh, uh, social media is a reflection of the wasteland of the social atmosphere that um it would require a totally devastated social world for people to be willing to flock to social media in the ways that they have um not necessarily that social media caused it but rather that the reason that social media is popular is is a reflection of the devastated social world that we exist in it, that echo uh there reminded me of that and i thought it would be interesting to bring it up i think that was in the the uh believe that was in the the piece now by the invisible invisible committee beyond ideological and political analysis and criticism of cinema culture and the stark hegemonic structures out of which films arise there are opportunities present for differential and diacritical engagements that supply wider explanatory insights into the complex dialectical relationships at work between power and popular culture, entrenchment and transformation, and cinematic and cultural projections and receptions. In other words, against the hegemonic projections of Hollywood cinema bent on inculcating power-friendly and policy-supportive attitudes and beliefs into material and ideological public space, a critical film pedagogy will engage in political and ideological critiques of power to expose power's dreadful political, social, and historical injustices and systemic nature. Additionally, it will engage in counter-readings to both explore the combinatorial links between politics, culture, militarism, and ideology, and reveal alternative and oppositional possibilities that disrupt and undermine hegemonic foreboding and reactionary positions in order to combat and escape from the destructive and oppressive powers of militarism, with the goal of opening new and expanding old options for struggling towards a realizable, socially just peace and a solidaristic internationalism." End quote. I was quite pleased to find Morris's thesis online when searching for provocative sources on militarism in fictional media. I've enjoyed applying writing about pedagogy to online discourses, because there's an educational element to a lot of this entertainment content, and beyond just getting as much of the information right as possible when we make content or have conversations, it's also important to have a strong self-concept of what we're trying to do in these discourses, as well as some kind of standard for what we're doing, and some knowledge of what its effects are. I've learned a lot in the seven going on eight years at time of writing I've been uploading videos and weird rants to YouTube, especially about how these platforms work in terms of how people engage. If I knew how they work in terms of having a perfect concept of the algorithm, I'd have a million subscribers. But I've seen how videos inspire certain kinds of social engagements in terms of how they're constructed, and that's led me to have certain opinions about the effects of certain kinds of content on the platform. Lots of us have feelings like that about many of the social media platforms we inhabit. The natural implication is that some behaviors, ways of speaking, and ways of thinking are constructive to learning and others are not. For example, why am I quote tweeting this post or commenting on this YouTube video about fascism in a work of art I like? What's my motivation? If this behavior isn't conducive to learning and I engage in it consistently, am I admitting that I'm not here to learn? That those who have this type of disagreement have nothing to teach me and can be disregarded before I've heard them out? The need to have a conversation, the desire to have a conversation, these things are not neutral, not like this. 
Someone with, for example, an ideological impulse to undermine the place of a minority group in society is implicitly threatening that group with their perspective, so their desire or demand to have it presented is the precursor to that threat. On the other hand, the very real need to imagine and develop a better society requires learning, and thus also social behavior that allows a certain openness to conversation. When we address the topic of militarism in games, we're at a crossroads where on the one hand, there's an opportunity for imagination that provokes us to ask questions or make proclamations in a public setting. And on the other hand, many enthusiastic participants in that discussion are somewhere on the spectrum of outright intentional bad faith actors trolling to run interference to self-deluding bad faith actors who operate in a headspace where certain behaviors are the norm for intellectual discussion. A function of pedagogy is to inform not so much what we think as how we think, and therefore to also instill a certain way of thinking implicitly. This affects our capacity for imagination and our ability to strive for all human aims. Imagining a changed world is necessary for the process of changing the world. It is difficult to imagine circumstances which are not themselves singular alterations otherwise copacetic with our society as it is. One moment. going to bed. Aww. In Morris's own words, quote, it is difficult to imagine a demilitarized culture operating within a militarized political and economic order, and it is difficult to imagine a demilitarized political and economic order operating within a militarized culture. These ideologies feed the materialities, and the materialities feed the ideologies, end quote. In other words, to imagine the future, we must create the future, and to create the future, we must imagine the future. What better, higher, nobler role could there be for science fiction? In the case of Halo Reach, I posit that the function of gameplay is, unsurprisingly, interaction, at which point there emerges a key question, something I danced around earlier, but which I will now state directly. Per Morris's idea that the art depicting militarism inspires a reaction to that militarism, not merely conformity to its values but commentary on them, the interactivity of the game may also lead to a dedoxification, that being a kind of restating of the theme or idea but on its head, similar to the function of parody. This is at once both a teaser for a future essay and also a fundamental concept to understanding how I have chosen to approach deconstructing games. The implication of this in Reach is that representing militarism directly may have deeper implications beyond a prescriptive representational exegetic meaning purely due to player involvement and interaction. Put more reservedly, representing an idea can inspire opposition to it, uh -huh. which can in turn be invited by promoting player interaction. Reach is deep, precisely because it is a game and is also unreservedly everything that it is, doing everything that it does, nailing down the idea of the hero-soldier striving beyond the limits of human civilization to perfection, elevating the human concept fundamentally beyond where it has historically been in contribution to the Halo franchise. It may seem strange to you that such a positive takeaway from such a reading of Halo Reach is even possible in the first place. Perhaps you've heard that it is possible and even necessary to critique those works of art which compel us, to analyze that which we love. But many... Who said that? Who's, who's, who was the one who said that? Who was it? Lesser-minded people would, I think, imply some kind of moral failing in liking a work of art that contains troubled themes. But not me. I love Halo Reach. I don't even love it despite these themes, these ideas, these expressions. I love it because of them, too. Again, this might seem strange, but it isn't to me. Look at the story of the planet Reach, of Noble Team, and all the human beings there. It's a tragic story, but it is also a beautiful story. If we step back, perhaps we can be open-minded enough to see also the tragedy in war, in militarism, and also the beauty in small human acts, in selfless camaraderie, in loyalty and fraternity. These feelings, for me, 
coexist and are even inseparable. War is the tragedy, but if we can learn from it, then perhaps one day, we or those who come after will deliver hope to a war-torn world. Wow. Now, before we talk any further about this video, which we will, I'm going to share this in the chat. And I want you all to go over right away. Just click that link. Please go press like and also Please leave a kind and, and lovely comment for Chariot. Chariot puts a lot, lot, lot. And of course, subscribe to Chariot if you're not subscribed already. Chariot puts a lot of hard work into these videos and uh, deserves our support. That was a real treat. So go do that. There's the link right now. Go click that. Just If you do nothing else, leave a like. Okay? Seriously. Great video. I'll have to watch it again, though. Some of it went over my head. Um, that's understandable. This is a pretty uh, deep look into this, into into Halo Reach, and and it's understandable that in a in a stream react, you might not catch everything on a first view. But I strongly encourage you. It's a great watch, and that felt like time went flew while we were watching while we were watching and reacting to that. I think the. Um, I think the topic of, of, like, fascist, fascist influenced art or art that carries fascist themes, um, is like. I, I don't know. I think that Chariot's really onto something in the way that there's a, there's a limited frame. You could even argue there's a moralistic frame, um, that people get trapped in. And I don't mean moralistic as in they're, they're, uh, they're saying that it's good or bad. I mean that there is a preoccupation with, with the act of declaring something good or bad in and of itself um, that can sometimes impede a meaningful and more useful analysis of a work of art. Um, you know, people are rushing to, to make a to make a, a, a read or a take or whatever that says, like, I'm on the right, right, you know, side of this particular issue. And I think everyone can be guilty of this sometimes to greater degrees and less. It doesn't really matter that much. But I do think that sometimes there is a an arrest that can happen that refuses to grapple or learn from what what even can be drawn um, from a story that, that contains themes like that. Um, but it is a complicated thing, right? Like, um, you know, I, I see Arachnoid in chat bringing up, um, you know, D the Darth Vader thing. Um, uh, Star Wars is one of those uh, franchises where I think literally, I think it was for Star Wars that the term like, maybe I'm wrong. Hold, hold on. Let me double check this before I say something stupid. It's the the woo, the term woobification. Okay, so yeah, it refers to a character from from uh, from another cartoon, wooby. But I've heard it most frequently used in the context of Star Wars. So I don't know if it was originally used to describe that, but a wooby is a name for basically any type of character who makes you feel ex extremely sorry for them. Um but the woobification of like Star Wars characters is something that um, that I've heard a lot, which is like, and Star Wars seems particularly vulnerable for it, to it. Like um, an example of this, uh, uh, an example of this is like, like I've driven around town and I've seen people with bumper stickers on their car of the Galactic Empire, you know? And I'm like, Oh man, that's 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 a that's a doozy to engage with, you know, um, like 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 to to see a a a work 
and we oh, we had this conversation a bit with um, with Starship Troopers a bunch, right? Like uh, um, for for people to totally miss not just miss the themes of a piece, but also uh, uh, to take aspects of it and and just distort them to their own needs. And I think that's always a I don't know. I, I feel like I, I I've I got so distracted by talking about the Wooby thing that now I'm 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 trying to figure out what the point I was trying to make was here. Um, what I'm trying to say is that there's like, uh, it's a complex conversation. Well, I, I understand, I remember where I was going with this. What I'm trying to say is I understand why people are concerned with being able to take a piece of like, you know, a work that is steeped in, you know, fascist ideology and be able to explain it and make people understand, you know, to be able to criticize it. But I also do think that that can be a limiting frame. And so I appreciate the approach that Chariot has here to uh, saying, okay, like let's let's approach this from a different angle. Let's, let's approach this from a, a slightly deeper angle that's willing to like talk about these things, but not necessarily in, in the name of going, okay, this is a fascist work or whatever, but instead saying, well, what can be learned from it regardless? What can we take away from this story that perhaps uses uh, tropes that are popular among fascists? How do we, what can we, where can we go from there? It, and, and I think I appreciate that a lot. Um, yeah, learning is hard. Um, but it, it, it's just, like, and, and, and I don't know, it, it, it is hard because there is there are games where uh, some of the stuff that was talked about in this video, um, like the, 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 the detailing of different uh, martyrs, you know, soldier martyrs and, and, and uh, the, 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 you know, the tomb of the forgotten soldier type stuff uh, and the martyrdom type stuff. Like these themes are present in other works uh, and so much less compelling. And I feel like, um, uh, I don't know, like I think of like a Call of Duty game, you know what I mean? And uh, I think it's hard to like look the other way when Call of Duty produces a game about like soldier martyrs and and glorifying the you know uh, in, in in a sick way glorifying and salivating over the role of soldiers uh, while also taking huge sums of money from the U.S. government uh, uh, and and also presenting narratives that are strictly um, you know, strictly like pro-American intervention and, and, and almost, I wouldn't even say some of them are like anti-war kind of, but they're anti-war in the like, in like while justifying or, or completely, um, doing historical revision on actual historical events in which the American empire has, um, <laughs> culpability. And in a game like that, uh, I can see that it, I, I don't know, it seems harder to be able to, to step back and analyze than in a game like Halo Reach. But it might, I, I still think it's valuable to do so, right? Like perhaps we, we fail to actually be able to learn from these things by, uh, I don't know, by rushing to even one that's obvious like that by rushing to put it in a box. But it is hard, you know, and I don't mean to go back and forth all over this, but I guess I guess the conversation being had here and the, the ideas being touched upon by Chariot are very compelling to me. Um, there was a section uh, in this video in which Chariot uh, mentions the, the like, that dynamic of like, Oh, well, somebody, you know, why won't you debate us about our insert bigoted opinion here? And then it's like, well, why should I have to, you know, why should I have to debate you about your bigoted opinion? Your bigoted opinion is a direct threat to me. Why should I ever have to sit down and give you time to hear your bigoted opinion? Um, and uh, 
that is something that is a that is a topic and a subject that I have struggled with for a very very long time, and I do think that there's like, I think there's a a it carries over into art into you know why should we give uh, works that have themes that are distasteful or 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 bad or even opposed to us the time of day should we and i think the answer is maybe depends on the context right yeah i think it depends on the piece uh Chopped Liver says, I think also due to sample size because Halo has a lot of lore and a lot of it is dedicated to showing how horrible the extremely militarized society in Halo is. Well, I think that there's... That might be true. But also, um, even in... Even in stories that sometimes, like, show the horrors of war, there can nonetheless be a glorification of that, Right? Like um, that, even the even the citation of that fascist uh, manifesto uh, that that like there the depiction the glorious depiction of the tanks and the battles and the even the death and the the stench of putrefaction can be turned into a a, a desirable aesthetic, which can be utilized in in sinister ways. But uh, I think I agree with with uh, Chariot's aim in advancing the ability to talk about these things to a, to a better and more useful level, um, to encouraging people to uh, develop a way of talking about these games that can be more helpful, that can allow us to pull more, uh, even from games that might present ideas or, or, or might present uh, uh, worldviews that are totally opposed to ours. Yeah. I feel like I'm going to be thinking about this for a while. I really enjoyed this video. And now I kind of want to play Halo Reach. <laughs> Uncle Gumbold says fascists can't make art, though. Um, they struggle, okay? It's not 100% uh, that, that no fascist has ever made, uh, ha can never make art. Uh, it's just that um, fascists struggle with the creation of art uh, often because of their own limitations. You know what I mean? Um, there have, of course, been conservatives and fascists who have made compelling or interesting art nonetheless. Um, but I think this isn't really about fascists making art so much as it is, um, you know, in this particular case, the elements of fascism that are present in our society inevitably being the materials that we make art out of sometimes. Like, like, for example, um, okay, if you if you're building blocks, if you are if you desire to make art, but the only object that you have around is the discarded weapons of dead soldiers, you are going to make art that incorporates the weapons of soldiers. It might transform them, it might uh, su uh, subvert them, uh, but it might not. Also, uh, and and I think that's something that's that's constantly present uh and i think that's this pre you know what part of what's being discussed in this video is how do we how do we imagine a world that we're not in and then and how do we take steps towards a world that doesn't exist yet you know um and and i mean it is i think it is a process i think it's it's a a, a it's feedback loops of saying okay we are going to look for something different 
We are going to create something different. Something different inspires us. We are going to look for something different. We are going to create something different. Something different inspires us, and so on and so forth. A small crawl away from what is. Um, you know, what's the Marx quote? Communism is the real movement to abolish the current state of things. Uh, yeah, it's kind of uh, it's kind of one of those things where it's like uh, we recognize that that what we are building with is is uh, you know we live in a war torn world. We live in a world that is built on top of a war torn world. We live on top of a world on top of a world that was built on top of another war torn world, and so on and so forth. Um, but how do we step away from that while we're grabbing things from a war-torn world? Sometimes we have to be able to uh, to parse through it and and take that thing and use it as a springboard to go forward. I hope that everything that I said there made sense. I don't feel like I can follow up off the cuff with any sort of conversation that will be as impactful or even thoughtful as an essay with that level of preparation and thought. But I hope what I said made sense and some of my musings made some sense there. I'm also getting very tired. But anyway, go subscribe to Chariot. I will definitely be putting this up as a segment so hopefully some of the viewers who aren't here now will catch that segment in the future and go check it out. Um, thanks for watching.